Okay. So my name's Hugh. My name's Hugh Blemings. Um, I started working for the Open Compute uh, project about four hours ago. So you'll all be familiar with that sensation when you're new to a job and um, not really knowing what you can and can't say and those sorts of things. Right. Um, <laughs> happily, so the Open Compute project um, is basically a set of open standards that was originally developed by Facebook but then um, spun off to be an open source or an open project. And the, the, set of the, the various um, designs that were made available are all about building energy efficient data centres. So uh, companies like Facebook, Rackspace and others who build these huge, huge data centres have an increasing need for compute power but obviously need to do that and want to do that in the most energy efficient way possible. So the idea was that with informing the Open Compute Foundation was that um, these, these designs that have been produced could be uh, open sourced or released under open source licences to allow different companies to build hardware based on them but also to build off all the experience we've had with open source software, that collaborative development model. So in the way that we, um, we're so used to a very fast pace of innovation in the software space, the, the aim of the Open Compute Project was to see that realised on the hardware side of things. So what we now have is um, the set of standards that include everything pretty much from how a data centre should be air conditioned right down to what size the motherboard should be and how the processor and other parts of the system should interconnect. Um, I've joined as the Director of Certification and um, we have two certification labs, one in Taipei, one in the US uh, in San Jose, uh, in San Antonio I should say. And these are a venue where hardware manufacturers can actually pr uh, bring their hardware to be certified and get an open compute um, sticker. I guess the thing that um, struck me as might would be relevant to an open, a talk on open government is that there's an increasing and appropriately increasingly increasing amount of interest in government circles to do energy efficient designs. And one of the things that the uh, the open compute designs has accomplished is um, a, a, a very significant increase in energy efficiency and the sorts of things that um, get talked about is the, the ratio between power that goes into a data centre, so you consider the power coming in off the grid, to what actually ends up at the individual compute nodes. And um, from what I've read, and bearing in mind of, uh, I'm still quite new to this myself, but the sort of numbers that we see uh, in the industry at the moment are typically ratios of about 1.8 to 1.9 to 1. So if you think of that, about 80 to 90 per cent of the power that's going into a data centre is actually being used to, to run the air conditioning, put the lights on, do all those sorts of things. Um, what, the, what typical open compute data centres are seeing are, en are energy efficiencies closer to 1.4 to 1. So you've got about a, a 40 to 50 per cent improvement on, uh, on energy efficiency, which if you consider these data centres can often consume hundreds of kilowatts, if not megawatts of electricity, you're starting to talk about energy savings where, gee, we don't need to build that power station anymore. So there's a, there's a tremendously good um, environmental, uh, environmental outcome there. The other side of it is um, improvement in terms of the, by having these open standards that everyone can build to, you get better reuse of your hardware. So if you consider a typical rack of computing equipment, as often as not when you update that, you've got to sort of replace almost the whole thing in, in, in a traditional design. What the open compute uh, reference designs allow you to do is instead of the, uh, the network switches, for example, they can stay the same often for a couple of generations of hardware because they've been, they've been built to, open, to a standard that everyone can use and so you don't have the problem with having to replace the, um, the network infrastructure. Power distribution is another significant factor in a, in a large data centre where every time you convert uh, electricity from different from the high voltage that comes in off the grid down to the very, very low voltages that are used on a motherboard, you lose, um, you lose energy as, a, as an efficiency ratio at work there. So the standards have provided a common way of providing electrical power to the rack that is consistent from system to system. So when you replace your um, uh, your compute nodes, you don't, necessarily, you don't have to change all that power infrastructure out. That saves in terms of uh, cost because you don't have to uh, physically buy new hardware, but it's also good from an environmental standpoint again because you're not having to throw out a whole bunch of uh, electronics to be recycled and go through the, the whole, that, that whole cycle as well. I think I'll leave my introductions there because that's about as much I think as I can so usefully say off the, off the bat, but I'll, uh, I'll happily answer questions as best I'm able as we go along. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think I said Donna next. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, oh yes, put your video on. Put my video on. Please. It's on. Danke. It may be taking a minute to come back, but anyway, it's on. <laughs> Thank you. Can you see me? I can see you twice. <laughs> oh, excellent, fabulous. <laughs> so um, I think you wanted me to talk about Drupal stuff, maybe? Yeah. Um, 
So just a very brief background on why I would be talking about Drupal stuff. I'm uh, a board member of the Drupal Association, the US-based 401, I guess, you know, open foundation behind Drupal. Um, I'm also been, um, I've also been chairing the uh, community working group. So it's the kind of the soft side of the community where the uh, issues get raised that are completely non-technical. Um, but I've also recently been working with um, Previous Next, who are the Australian Drupal company behind AGOV, an Australian um, distribution of Drupal, uh, particularly aimed at government, and the take-up of that has been quite extraordinary. So I've got a lot of different hats, as is often the case with these things. Um, so that's sort of my connection. Drupal's connection to government, I think, ha is... Um, is pretty well established now in the, the big um, poster, I guess, site was when um, the US White House adopted Drupal for their main website and as a sort of spearhead for a bunch of open government projects that were going on there. But that's just kind of the big shiny one. Um, a lot of other governments around the world have been using Drupal um, for much longer um, and organisations like the United Nations have been um, using Drupal. So. Um, you know, the Australian push and that international push has really kind of um, had a lot of people engage with the community directly. Um, so, you know, there are people working in government who are, you know, just considered part of the Drupal community. And then there are also um, organisations around the world or companies around the world who are specialising in um, focusing on Drupal for government and dealing with a lot of the issues that governments face and dealing with them in their kind of collaborative, open sourcey kind of way that we all know and love. Um, I think that's probably it for my intro. Cool. Thank you very much. All right, to Michael. Does this mic work with it clipped on? Yeah. You can hear me? Yes. Cool. Hi, so my name's Michael. Uh, I don't recognise most of you, so you probably don't recognise me. Um, I work on a project called OpenStack. Uh, in fact, Rackspace is, as a company is nice enough to fund me working full time on the open source project. Um, OpenStack is an infrastructure as a service set of components that you plug together to build clouds. Uh, so, you know, you can go and build your own private Amazon EC2 compatible cloud, for example, and, you know, run your software there. Um, there are really three things that people build, use OpenStack to build. They use it to build large public clouds. Rackspace, HP, um, Companies like that are building public cloud products where you can just show up at a website with a credit card and run virtual machines, much like you can with Amazon. And then there are a lot of companies that will sell you private clouds using the same software. So, you know, Red Hat, Canonical, Rackspace. The problem with giving you a list is there's so many companies I'm bound to exclude someone and someone will be offended. I, you know, IBM, etc., will all quite happily sell you your own Amazon-style Elastic Compute Cloud in your data center. And then the third thing people do is hybrid stuff, where you say, you know, my stuff's in my data center, but I don't know, budget night, I have to serve a lot more traffic than I would normally, so maybe I want to burst to a public cloud for a little bit. And then, you know, have that running while I need it, and then throw it away when I don't, kind of thing. Um, the attraction of, like, there are, there are other software packages that do this. Uh, the attraction of OpenStack is that it's open source. It's multi-vendor. Like I said, there's a lot of companies involved, to the point where it, I can no longer list them because I'm bound to offend someone. Um, and we're all working on a common code base. We're all kind of pulling in the same direction. It's also very pluggable. I work on the compute component, and we support pretty much every top-tier hypervisor that's available. So if you're a VMware shop, we support vCenter. If you want to use KVM because you don't want to pay a license fee for your hypervisor, we do that. Uh, there's power, like IBM Power support uh, for hypervisors, that sort of thing. So it's deliberately all about not locking you into a particular vendor. I think. People in government would probably care about this stuff, bearing in mind I left government myself 15 years ago, because it gives you control over things like where the data is stored. So, you know, from a data sovereignty perspective, you probably want to care about whether or not your data is in Australia or New Zealand or wherever you're from. And so if you're controlling the cloud yourself, you can do that. If you control the cloud, you can also specify what sort of human being is doing system admin tasks on it. Like, I imagine some people require citizenship, for example. Um, so you have all of that level of control. And another advantage of, say, private cloud is if you have, you know, slightly unusual requirements, you can express those. So if you have an existing SAN or you need a particular kind of GPU for whatever you're doing, then all of that can exist in your private cloud and off you go. 
Uh, but I'm a software engineer, not a salesman. So I don't particularly want you to buy from any one particular company or anything like that. I just want you to use OpenStack because it's awesome. Uh, cool. We'll jump to Alex. Hey. hey. Um, so uh, I'm Alex. I work at a company called Link Digital, and um, I'm head of the data publishing and visualization practice. And um, basically, we work with government clients to help them get their data out there. So we use a lot of free and open source software like WordPress, Drupal, which of course sits on the LAMP stack. And then we have the uh, free and open source uh, DevOps software. So it helps us you know, get these projects underway really quickly. But one of the most exciting technologies we work with is called CCAN. And CCAN is um, kind of the de facto standard in um, open data portals, but it's also open source. So I get to participate in um, you know, maintaining that software and writing plugins. So CCAN has been pretty popular in Australia in the last year. Um, there's DataGov.au, of course, but uh, three states, Queensland, South Australia, and New South Wales have all decided to use this software. It's even being used internally in some organizations like CSIRO, so they can you know, maintain a catalog of what data they have. But the really exciting part about this software is that it uses all these open standards and data APIs so you can kind of integrate it with other tools for data visualization, data publishing. So um, for example, if you upload a CSV file or an Excel file, and you know an Excel file can be quite hard to use in a browser. So instead what it does is it actually inserts that into an SQL database and then provides an SQL standard API. It's a real Postgres um, SQL server running in the background. And then you can create, you know, graphs, and you can search that spreadsheet, even if it's much larger than what you can download. Um, and another example of that is um, we recently wrote a feature to do a similar thing with geospatial data, which we relied on a lot of free and open source software to get out of the proprietary formats, so the ESRIs and the Google Earth formats, and then turn that into standard. SQL that we could put into PostGIS, which again is a free piece of software, <laughs> and probably you know we couldn't have afforded an Oracle or something. So it was really great that one of the best GIS databases was you know very well maintained and was out there. So we you know we just duct taped using Python you know these different tools that let you get out of this format, turn it into that format. You know, you can use all kinds of things. It's really exciting to be able to chain these tools together. And I think that's the, the most important thing about the place where open infrastructure um, integrates with open data is that, um, you know, it's one thing for us to provide this data to people, but if they don't have the infrastructure, if they don't have the freely available tools to you know, manipulate this data, then it's not very useful. So it's great that there is a free and open source software community that can develop tools to allow people to interact with data in new and interesting ways. Cool, okay. Um, I might just uh, remind everyone, there's a, a wiki for this um, mini-conf uh, that's linked to this schedule on linksconf.au for the Open Government mini-conf page. Uh, so if you have links and stuff, um, please add it to there. And I might ask all, the, all our panelists to just add any links they think might be useful to that uh, after the panel for everyone's reference. Uh, and now I'll go to Andrew. Uh, thank you. So quick disclaimer, I don't actually speak for the New Zealand government. Hold I on, hold on. <coughs> I think, Not, is it loud enough? You can hear it OK? OK, Excellent. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I don't actually work for the New Zealand government. I work for a company called Catalyst IT. We, I just happen to have an interest in what's going on with our, with our government and what they're doing around uh, in particular open source and uh, open data. So 
I'm just going to give a very quick overview of where I see things sitting at the moment. I'm just going to touch on what some people have talked about already. Uh, so first up, we actually have a website called data.gov.nz, which is a portal for the open data that's already been be made available. And the great thing about it is there's also a uh, facility where you can request additional data that is already available to be made, well, that's you know, public information, but is not available in a machine readable format. Uh, you can go and request that. It can take a little while for it to happen, but eventually they'll make that information available. Uh, I've gone through that process myself, asking for a list of the ministers and their roles to be made available, and it's there now. It's available as a CSV file. Uh, YAML is coming in the very near future, I'm assured. So there are some aspects like that which are actually really, really great, and we're, we're very progressive in that area, I believe. Uh, one area we're in perhaps not quite so progressive is we've recently, the New Zealand government has decided to move to a model where there was a short list of organisations that can be used for procuring services, uh, which is supposed to make life easier. Um, unfortunately, it's limited what companies can be used. Uh, fortunately, you can, you know, fortunately, there are a number of <coughs> open source companies on those lists, uh, and government departments are not limited to using those, but they have to justify why they don't want to use them. So they can use existing relationships, but you, you know, they have to justify it. Uh, another area is that they want to consolidate a lot of the different types of software that's being used. Uh, for example, there are currently over 600 websites for the New Zealand government and state-owned enterprises and so on using about 50 different content management systems. So a lot of those, some of those are proprietary, some of them are open source, you know, there are some Drupal ones or whatnot else. Uh, they've decided to consolidate on one. Uh, so following a tender process, a product called Silverstripe was chosen. The great thing about that is it is actually open source software. You can get it, you can hack on it yourself, and Silverstripe are a consulting service, a company. So they'll write additional plugins and whatnot else. So we are seeing open source as being preferred solutions in some cases, which is really great. On the infrastructure point of view, which is where these guys come in, uh, New Zealand government's decided to consolidate basically everything to three hosting companies. Uh, and basically, they've said to government departments, you guys shouldn't run your own servers anymore, unless you really have to. Uh, they will have to go into managed data centers uh, on virtual machine platforms. The really sad thing is, uh, none of them are using fully open source solutions. We've seen VMware, we've seen Oracle OVM as being the solutions used. I'm really keen to see OpenStack become an option. Uh, we have been talking to some of those providers about potentially using OpenStack. So there is some movement there. There's certainly some interest. Uh, and also, I'd love to see Open Compute Project being used as the actual physical compute layer uh, because of all the benefits around uh, Open Compute provides. Uh, and certainly, we're looking at that ourselves as, as well. Uh, coming back to the open source side of things, we've seen some really great use of open source within the New Zealand government. There's not only Silverstripe. We've also seen Moodle, which is a e-learning system is used a lot for internal uh, professional development within government departments. We're seeing Koha, which is a library management system developed in New Zealand, uh, fully open source. That's been used to manage a lot of internal libraries for government departments, as well as for public libraries as well. Uh, Ministry of Education has funded Mahara, which is a digital portfolio for students to use to showcase their work. So we've. Uh, Catalyst has been very lucky to receive a lot of funding to work on that project. It's been very interesting to see develop, and it's been used worldwide. All of these products are, or projects are. And there's a lot of Drupal websites currently out there within the government space. Um, we may see those get replaced with, by Silverstripe. It's really hard to set this at this point in time. Uh, the only thing that's really sad is that we've seen a lot of tenders coming through from government departments and state-owned enterprises through our, the tender system that we have in New Zealand that are specifying closed source proprietary solutions. So it's a tender, but it's saying you have to use this technology over here and we won't consider anything else. Uh, this is wrong, completely wrong. That should not be the way it, it should be. Uh, there are a lot of organisations within New Zealand, such as NZ Rise, which are actively working to stop this. 
uh, this is also extending to using uh, Freedom of Information Act requests to ask why tenders were given to a particular organisation to make that public information and consumable and so we can prove that the tender process is, is wrong in some cases. So that's where okay. I stand. All right, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to um, just do a little bit of q and A. I I might kick off with a, a couple of questions to start, so get your questions ready uh, and then we'll be able to, to ask these guys a little bit, a little bit more. So one of my questions, my first question I guess for the panel is, um, uh, and Alex touched upon this and um, a few people have touched on it just briefly, but we're, we're sort of working on the assumption, um, and it's probably because of the conference that we're at and because of the community that we're in, that open is a good thing at all. Um, but why, why do open infrastructure? You know, what are the benefits to governments? What's the benefits to society? What, what are the be competitive benefits of having open infrastructure, whether it be open source, open hardware, you know, stacks for use in government? Um, do um, we want to go the reverse way? Can I just... Um, so from my point of view, the, the big benefit for government... Closer to you. So what I see is the really big benefit is, not, is avoiding vendor lock-in. You know, we're spending public money on infrastructure and services, and basically I don't think that government should get screwed over and locked in, because it's spent a lot of money gets spent, so, yeah. Okay. Oh wait, there was someone in between, it was Alex? Oh, you could, yeah, well we'll do here first and then we'll see. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so I totally agree with the vendor lock-in uh, thing, right? Um, the reality is that sometimes people have a falling out with their vendor and it's nice to be able to go somewhere else um, without throwing the entire world away. I think the other thing is, I personally think that open development is inherently more efficient, right? If I look at the OpenStack project, we have thousands of developers working for dozens of companies and we're all pulling in the same direction. If we were all doing our own thing, we'd in fact probably employ more people because we'd have all this wasted effort, right? Um, but in return for pulling, pulling together, we're moving much faster than we would otherwise. And so that reduces the cost of ownership for people who invest in these systems because you know, they're, they're not, they don't have to fund all this you know, repeated wasteful development. So? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with all that too. I think um, that was certainly one of, the, one of the catalysts, I think, for the Open Compute project coming about was to avoid vendor locking, because if you're building big data centre, you want to be able to get as many competitive bids on the hardware as possible, and if everyone's got to build things the same way, then it doesn't really matter which manufacturer uh, you go to for that. So I think that's been, it's been uh, a, real, a real motivator there. I think, and I'd certainly endorse Michael's comments too around the, the sort of whole innovation space is that if, you, if you're opening or if you, if you have an open hardware platform to innovate with, then everyone can contribute. You can have the best uh, networking engineer that might come from an organisation in Taipei working alongside someone who's building the air conditioning designs that's based out of, out of Norway, you, you, uh, like, we, like we do so with our, inherently with our open source, pro, open source software projects, we can get the input from the best people, no matter where, they, where they're mm. physically located. Cool, okay. So it's also leveraging best skills mm. available. Um, Alex and then Donna, do you guys want to go? <laughs> Alex? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah, I, I touched upon that, but, uh, you know, aside from it being good for open, it's also, uh, you know, good for competition, because, you know, like, uh, if you're, we, we always have that, that thing with gun hack that, you know, you have these hackers in their bedrooms making better applications than some people who do it as their day job. That, you know, if you provide these open platforms, you're allowing, you know, small businesses or just individual programmers or just people who've never had the opportunity to develop these applications, if you have these open projects, this open infrastructure, then the cost of entry for those people is low enough that it's actually achievable for people to develop their skills and develop their services. Cool. Donna? Sorry, I just had to turn my mic back on. Um, I, yeah, it's easy for us as people in the open source community to make the assumption that, of course, open would be just as good for government as it is for us. So it seems a little counterintuitive to try and make the argument, but I think... Uh-oh. <laughs> um, but I think the thing that 
really stands out at the moment is it's the with enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Mm. And given our current world of um, governments wanting to be less transparent and wanting us as individuals to be more transparent um, and surveil every aspect of our lives, having the code be available to all and sundry means that perhaps we can have a little bit more um, uh, we can see a little further into the window of what our governments are doing if they're using a code base that is open. Um, I don't think that that should be um, miss or um, underestimated. There's a benefit. Okay, cool. Um, the other one I might um, just throw out there is whether anyone has any comments about things like, um, um, uh, I guess, open infrastructure from a perspective of government um, playing a role or not playing a role in things like um, internet regulation or those kinds of things. Like, what what infrastructure is open infrastructure useful for um, delivering services, or um, you know, is there a place for not having open infrastructure? What's your perspective on open internet? Is I guess where I'm getting to. <laughs> Does that fit? Maybe not. Kind of hard to answer. I'd say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, that was a hard one. All right, I'll leave it. <laughs> just a thought. All right, well, then. Um, I thought we just answered that pretty much. So. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Questions from the floor. Hi. Um, this is a reflection of something that we also start to see in New Zealand. I don't know whether we're going to see it over here, but we're moving now beyond the infrastructure story. You know, they've made that decision. They've chosen that there's three public cloud providers or all government cloud providers, but now they're saying start to dictate into the software tier. Right. So that we're never going to start seeing mandated standards that will be in all the government software stack. So this will cover operating system, middleware platforms, all the technology stack across mm. all the government departments. That's the next phase of what the IA is looking at. Are you seeing anything similar here and what's your perspective on this? All right, so just I'll repeat the question for the recording. And the question is, um, apparent, uh, so apparently in New Zealand uh, there's been a mandating of the three uh, cloud providers, and um, and it's uh, apparently moving towards mandating an entire stack, software stack. Uh, and the question is whether we're seeing that here in Australia. Are you, anyone want me to answer that one? <laughs> All right. The the simple answer to that is that that um, from my understanding, so there's we have three jurisdictions here. So what happens in other in different jurisdictions can actually be up to the jurisdiction about how they do things. And different procurement works in different ways. Although there are some rules that are consistent across the board. Um, and generally speaking, of it. Um, uh, things are not mandated about which particular software to use, um, but there are some uh, requirements around if you use software X, then you should comply to these standards. If you use software Y, you should comply to these standards. There are certain security standards that you have to comply to regardless of which software stack you use, um, but I am not aware of any you know, um, uh, enforcement of an entire stack um, across the board. Um, and in fact, there's a, a lot of push to um, ensure that there is open. Um, I, I actually think the procurement rules here are actually reasonably good in a lot of ways. Um, they do try to encourage people to come up with different solutions for things rather than specific products. Generally speaking, there's a few exceptions to the rule. So a part of this is to get an all of government price for all of you can eat. Uh, from an all-government price perspective, um, there there are some contracts here. So there's a whole-of-government uh, Microsoft contract, for instance, which basically says that there is a single price, which has brought down the cost dramatically from what it used to be down to a, a, a good price for government. But at the same time, it doesn't enforce that it's used. Is that a price for all of government or for each government department? For all of federal government. So they pay one amount? No, it's not they pay one amount. They pay one amount per seat. No, this is about paying one amount per vendor for software solution yeah. for as much as they can eat. No, I, yeah, and I understand what you're saying. So um, the specifics of how the Microsoft contract work here are actually um, pretty publicly available. Uh, it's called the Volume Sourcing Arrangements, and it's all available on the from my department's blog. Um, and, um, and the specifics of that were actually consulted on publicly before it was locked in, which was kind of useful. Um, but the, And there are a, a couple of those sort of contracting arrangements, but largely, but Having a contract arrangement in place that guarantees a particular price per unit doesn't enforce people to then use that product. So that it, you know, so that's kind of useful. Um, so I don't believe there are mandates on using a particular product, but where there are products that have um, major usage, there there are some um, arrangements that are put in place. Being mandated set of products. So the, the trick now is to be on that. 
I don't believe that um, Australia has that same problem to that extent at this point in time, but I can certainly check that out and come back. Anyone else can, want to say anything? comment on that? Yeah. Sorry, so bearing in mind I don't live in this space. Sorry, Donna. Right. Um, but the New Zealand plan strikes me as inherently risky. When I worked in the, for the Commonwealth Public Service about 15 years ago, cold fusion was where it was at, man. If we'd standardised the entire government on that, what happens when the vendor drops that product because Australia is too small a market to keep a product alive for? And you do see that here, right? Centrelink has this huge amount of code for mainframes in languages that no one programs anymore. They can't hire people to work on this stuff. And so, yeah, th it, it seems to kind of entrench this risk that the New Zealand government will diverge from reality over time and end up with this kind of, you know, yeah, <laughs> I don't like talking and I was scarred by school experience. But, um, you know, yeah, with this weird world where they can't bring other people in and they're not, you know, cross-pollinating with other things that are happening in the technology sector and then eventually they get abandoned by their vendor. So it, I, I think it sounds extremely risky and I think it's good that our government is not doing it. Well. So I'll certainly say that there's probably general... Um, opinion that this is probably not such a good thing to do. Uh, and, yeah, with, with e-government as well, and I think that's reasonably held within the uh, New Zealand IT sector as well. Uh, but at least the first one that's chosen, which was the website man content management system, at least they've chosen an open source project for it. So all else fails, they can fork it. However, whether they'll do that or not is, you know, we have to wait and see. Uh, but yeah, it's madness. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, other question? So the comment just for the recording was that um, here in Western Australia there's been um, a lot more interest in open source in recent years and, um, and that seems to be going the way of the future? Yeah. That's what you said? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I guess on just my experience, I mean I've been, I, I used to sort of work very hard trying to change uh, government procurement from the outside from um, when I was involved in Linux Australia years ago and, um, and now I'm on the inside so it's sort of been interesting. But in the last five years in particular, it's changed entirely. Open source used to be the dirty little secret of the IT department, and even then, it's only some people. Um, and now you get people saying, well, if you're going to do any software development, you make sure you open source it. There's now an open source policy in government that says, if you're doing um, development, you should be open sourcing it, and if you're involved in open source development, you should be engaging with the community. You know, it's, it's very, very interesting and quite changed times. Sorry, question here? No, I had a comment about that earlier. Please. Oh, hello. I'm going to actually just hold on just one sec. Do we have any other microphones? No, okay. Um, so what is a CEO? Wait, 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 wait. We're going to do run around. I'm going to make this man run. Can Where am I running? Him, uh, can you give him the microphone, please? And that way we don't have to repeat everything every time. So I'll get you and then I'll go to you next. Okay. That's all right. So I'm Charles Haynes. I used to be at Google for five years in infrastructure. We're I'm now at ThoughtWorks and we're friends with Rackspace and OpenStack. But I wanted to talk about the, the government surveillance observation because we've been working a little bit with governments, especially in Brazil and in Africa, and the open source argument there actually comes from the other side because the smaller governments are just as worried as we are about first world surveillance. And closed source, they have no control over that. But if the governments can use open source software, then they can make sure that they aren't being spied on by first world governments. And so there's a big push towards open source in the third world, the global south, to avoid surveillance from the first world, from the global north. Yeah. It also helps them develop local technological capability because right now they have to bring in experts from the global north in order to help them do development. Whereas if it's open source, they can home grow talent to work on their own software. Yeah. So there's a big push for open source in the, in the global south and, and in particular in Brazil. So I just thought I'd comment that the surveillance question works both ways. Yeah. And the, and the Brazil example is particularly interesting because uh, it did build a whole local industry 
and um, using open source as a way to bootstrap your local IT expertise and industry and ca capability, I think, has been proven in Brazil, in Spain, and in a number of countries now. Um, sorry, we had this man was next. Sure. Sorry. Thank you. You rock. Yeah. Wait, wait. Oh, microphone. Thank you. Hello. Uh, this woman back here blithely made a reference to a acronym CUA. I, uh, what is a common use agreement? Oh, microphone. <laughs> so, common use agreement is being explained for the people on the other side of the Google Hangout who can't hear us. This is so many levels. Okay, so, so a common use agreement is an agreement that's been set up by the WA uh, government that uh, like common software types or hardware types or even services are all um, established in an in a easy way to order uh, or procure, and it's called a common use agreement. It's just a term that the WA government use. Cool. Is that? All right. Oh, sorry, this gentleman was next, and then, then you, if that's okay? Cool. Actually, no, I'm not going to make you run back and forth. Sorry, I'm going to go to this man first. <laughs> Just there, please. Thank you. So you talked a little bit about uh, the Australian government not mandating um, a whole bunch of technology solutions, but we do have a whole bunch of whole of government arrangements which yes. you know all about, yeah. um, like the data f facilities, um, data centre facilities. Now, how aligned is that whole of government arrangement, which is mandatory for all Commonwealth departments, um, to the technology stacks that we're talking about here? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so, so a lot of those arrangements aren't mandatory. Some of them are, um, and uh, it, it gets a little complicated. So, for instance, there's a um, whole government arrangement called the um, Data Centre as a Service, um, the DCAS panel, uh, that, that um, agencies can use as a relatively fast-paced and, and easy way to procure anything that looks like a software as a service, um, cloud-like um, thing from a whole panel of um, companies, huge, huge, huge number of companies and services and stuff on it. Um, for anything that's less than 12 months, less than 80k, and that um, you know, meets some of the smaller um, procurement rules, uh, basically to make it easy to test pilot stuff. But it's not mandatory, so for instance. It's, it's going to be a little bit tricky because not everything is set in stone at the moment in terms of the new... I've just got to be careful how I say things. The new federal government's policy to... Um, um, which talks about shared services or cloud as the... Um, default for agencies for new services that are being implemented hasn't been defined in exactly what that looks like in implementation yet. That entire policy is in the process of um, being un, you know, looked at in terms of implementation at the moment um, between the Department of Finance and Department of Communications, all of which is public information, so my boss who is probably going to watch this is going to be fine with that, I'm sure. Um, but um, So how that looks isn't entirely defined yet. Um, there is still certainly the argument that uh, a lot of agencies will take the path of least resistance. So sometimes it's not something that's mandated which defines how things happen. It becomes the path which is easiest. So for instance, um, GovSpace, which is a whole of government content management system which currently has a WordPress option and a Drupal option is being added, has I think 80 or 100 government websites on it because it's easy for them to procure. It's not mandated, it's not, you know, um, it, it's something that they can spend a relatively small amount of money and know that they've got all their security um, uh, ramifications sorted, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's, there's, um, there's path of least resistance. There's if you choose particular technologies. So if you do choose a, a Microsoft um, operating system for your um, desktops, then there's a common operating environment standard which needs to be met and those kinds of things. So there's security requirements that need to be met. So, and, and it is problematic because the people doing the procurement are quite often are usually not the people who are doing the implementation, not the people who then do the ongoing contract management, so it does get a little bit tricky. But, um, so yeah, so th I think there's an active question about um, what infrastructure, um, how to enable government to best leverage open infrastructure where it meets the need, um, and, and what, if any, um, uh, procurement limitations or indeed other limitations get in the way of that happening. So, um, but, but I think from, I think the federal government's not, too bad in this respect. And, um, and what I've seen is that, particularly with web technologies, more and more and more open source has been used than ever before, not necessarily because there's a religious or, you know, or ideological interest in it, but because it has been, in a lot of cases, simply the best technology stack, and the easiest technology stack, and the cheapest technology stack, and all those kinds of things. So that's been a very interesting change, which by 
just the fact people are doing it has changed people's perception, which then has led to people starting to look at it for other potential things as well. well there's, there's an opportunity there. Mm. Uh, that's all right. No, uh, sorry. There's an opportunity there to influence the standards, but um, we're all happy if the standards are mandated as open standards and, and, and open infrastructure standards, as opposed to what we were hearing earlier, where if the standards get mandated as closed standards, um, then, we've, then we've lost that opportunity. I think so too, yeah. I think, that, I think that standards... I think that the difference between mandating a product and mandating a standard is that when you... Um, when you set a standard that everyone has to meet, it makes it easier, hopefully, if that standard is implemented in, across multiple different solutions and stacks, that you do avoid lock-in, uh, that you do make it easier to do the government as an API I was talking about before and actually have you know, um, uh, competition in the, in the delivery of those services and, and um, solutions. And, um, and it makes it easier to actually extract the, the data and services from a particular vendor or solution. There's some very powerful Yeah. Pia, can oh. I speak to this? Uh, yes, you can. Just, just hold. It. Yeah, and there, there, there are, um, and that's why the the transparency of policy development fits into all of this, and this this is why it's all related, <laughs> and this is why it's been so interesting to see the the open government movement kicking off, and sort of and and it leveraging on the skills and expertise of open of the open source background, but also people who are completely outside of the tech sector starting to see the benefits of this stuff to get better outcomes for government um, that have never traditionally sort of spoken in space. But yeah, no, really, really good points. Donna, please. Well, I, I think the, the moving around standards in a more general sense is definitely, you know, a positive, is sort of, you know, it's a bit dirt, really, in many ways. And one of the things that we found with, um, with AGOV is it kind of came out of us scratching our own itch, as a lot of open source things do, in that um, we were sol solving the same problem that governments and government agencies and government departments had over and over and over again in the same way with Drupal tools. So it sort of made sense to um, consolidate that, to kind of abstract out some of the differences that they were having just because they were different agencies and saying, well, could you do these things the same, use the same set of modules, use the same glue to bring those modules together and sort of what's been happening with Drupal um, uh, specifically with agov as a distribution for Australian government specifically means that we have done some of that consolidation but but because it's now on Drupal.org, um, anyone else can participate in that. And so, you know, we may have solved a particular problem in a particular way that's going to meet the needs of not only, say, federal government agencies, but also um, state government uh, jurisdictions and also getting into local government. And, you know, and I'm, I'm trying, I just actually just today, try to have a conversation with some people at BOM to say, well, can't we work together to get um, access to the right bits of data in the right way so that we can package that up in a Drupal module so anyone who's running a Drupal site for government anywhere in the country can suck down that module and whack it in. Um, you know, it, it means you can have those conversations, you can work collaboratively across jurisdictions, across borders, um, and then, you know, commercially or government or non-profit or what have you, you actually all start to benefit and stop having to reinvent that wheel every single time. So standards works and open works. And this is why I think, you know, this move for government, it's, of course it's not ideological, it's just practical, it's just pragmatic. All right, we're just going to take uh, one more, um, or maybe one, yep, sorry, over here, one more question. And just before that, though, one thing I, I would, wouldn't mind, Michael, if you wouldn't mind speaking to this, otherwise I'm happy to, <laughs> but I speak too much probably, is um, Nectar as an example, mm -hmm. just if you wouldn't mind, because I think as, as an example of what's happened in the research sector okay. and no, how that no, might be. No. Oh, yeah, no, we'll go to you first and then, because you've got the oh. mic. Yeah, it's a good point. Sure. Okay. Sorry. Um. Look, I'm originally from Brazil uh, and now living in New Zealand, so I totally agree with the gentleman from Google. I didn't catch your name. Uh, but the fact that um, you can inspect the code you're running in the government and you're sure about what you're running uh, is a big motivation for uh, using open source software. But I, now, now it's not only open source software, it's also open hardware because, um, you know, there are also spying devices that you could get on your hardware and also having the peace of mind that you know what's running inside your servers uh, is another big point. Um, now, there are some subtle things happening there. Uh, as a taxpayer uh, and removing my um, IT industry hat, um, honestly, why would we pay this huge amount in software licenses to other countries instead of retaining that wealth within our countries and helping the local market to develop? 
right? And what happens effectively when you're using open source software is that despite the software uh, being developed primarily by a company in another country, you still have uh, local consulting companies, local so uh, uh, service companies uh, developing uh, those skill sets and retaining that knowledge uh, and uh, the wealth in, in the country. So uh, there are many, many good reasons you know, why uh, we should use more and more open source software. It would be remiss of me to not mention that um, in most government IT projects, software is less than 10% of the budget. So it's, it's, it's worth keeping that in mind as well. But um, yeah, OK. Yeah, but it's still, it's still a point. It's still an important. Yeah, it's still, it's still a big number, but it's, just, but it's also worth just keeping the, the context as well. So I just, I, I just need to check. That's true. to uh, maintain the status quo. Yeah, so basically the... the <laughs> <laughs> that was beautifully done. So the rest of that comment was basically about um, the, the, the simplest path of procurement is usually to maintain the status quo and that, that's a problem from, a, um, from, from government being able to leverage some of these technologies and some of the skills and such. Um, Michael, can we go next, please? And then we'll, we'll just spend another five minutes in this panel and then we'll finish it and then we'll move on to the next panel. Cool. So I, the microphone's working, yeah? So Pierre is trying to t trick me into telling you about Nectar. So let me start with the disclaimer that I have never worked on Nectar, but I'm good friends with a bunch of people who did. So Nectar is really interesting, right? So what the Commonwealth Government here said is, um, you know, we have all these academics and they need to do, you know, compute-based research. And at the moment, they kind of, they either go and buy a machine and put it under their desk or they go and fight with their local IT department or they go to Amazon or whatever. Why don't we just provide compute resources to local academia? So for relatively small amounts of money, like I think we're talking low millions of dollars, they started deploying compute clusters built on OpenStack for academics. So the first cluster uh, was at University of Melbourne. It was about 4,000 CPUs. And basically anybody in Australia with a login at a university could just get a couple of virtual machines for free. If you needed more than that, like you had some sort of big Hadoop, big data project, then you could request resources and you'd have to tell them what your project was. It was a web form. And my understanding is that they were pretty much always approved. Um, now, eventually there'll be six of these. I think there's more than one up now, but like I said, I don't work on Nectar. So just, just very quickly. Um, no, it's mine. Hands off. No. <laughs> <laughs> so my understanding is that uh, there are at least six clusters one in each state, and they're all integrated. So if you're doing a, a big data project and you happen to be using data from a, uh, a rather large satellite array, for, um, for example, satellite dish array, you can get uh, machines near that data source. So you can do the processing there without having to pull terabytes of data back mm -hmm. to your local cluster. So as an academic or as, as a university student or whatever, you can get compute resources anywhere in the country Trivially. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's IVEC in Western Australia has one of these. I don't know if it's finished. There's one being built in Sydney. There's one that oh, I don't want to say who won the, the deal to do it um, because I don't know if it's announced. Uh, but there's one being built in Canberra. There's one that has been up for like a year or two in Melbourne, etc. And most of them have been done by academic groups like University of Melbourne. I'm aware of at least one where it's been outsourced mostly to a vendor to help. And so that's an interesting model as well. So, you know, for these six different locations, it wasn't really defined how you did this thing. What they said was you, you should use OpenStack because it needs to integrate with all the others. But, you know, if you want to outsource it to some sort of company, that's cool. If you want to do it in-house, don't care. And each different node is trying to offer something unique to the problem. So you might find that, you know, one cluster is GPU heavy or one cluster is very close to an interesting satellite array or something. Or, you know, one has lots and lots of storage. So they're all, they're all got slight tweaks on it. And then they've wrapped it all in this thing called OpenStack Cells, where you can say, I don't really care where my thing runs, just find me a place that's a good fit and run it. And so there's also this kind of national view where you can say, just give me a thing, and off it goes. And they paid no dollars for the software. Uh, it was all done with um, 
people relatively early in their careers. It was a good learning opportunity. A bunch of these people have gone off to do really interesting things afterwards. And it was just hilariously cost effective. Mm -hmm. And I might, um, I might just make one last comment and then, are there any other questions out there? All right, I'm gonna make one last quick comment and then we'll switch to the other one, um, to the other panel, or to the next panel. But um, I, I think one of the other things that needs to be uh, taken into account, which is a very interesting um, problem but has also created a, a, a very interesting, interesting divergence from traditional ways of doing procurement in, in government, is that traditionally all IT was controlled by the IT department. And IT departments, and I mean, I've, I've worked in several, as have probably most of the people here, have been under a huge amount of pressure for a huge amount of time to do more with less, to, to take all the risk, and at the same time to support my new, whatever the shiny new um, product is of the day for the CEO or for the, um, you know, for the secretary or, or whatever. So um, a lot of pressure, and so they've become, in many departments, certainly in federal government, I've seen this in the states as well in a lot of cases, become known as the no people. So then what happens is anyone wanting to do something um, is used to um, basically either persevere or just stop um, dealing with IT. But now that they can go and buy very cheap services elsewhere online, they're just going and saying, well, it's only five grand for 12 months to go and use whatever, or two grand or, or free to go and use external services. So there's now this weird proliferation of IT being run by government that um, is outside of the domain of, of the IT department, um, by HR, by PR, by you know, other parts of the business. And um, which has been both exciting to see new and interesting things being done and web teams starting to sprout up in whole different parts of the departments, often enough in the, in the um, communications team. Um, but, um, but at the same time, it's, it's creating you know, some interesting frictions around um, compliance and some of those issues as well. So um, one of the reasons why Nectar was so successful is because it filled a gap that made it really easy for researchers to get access to infrastructure that meant that they didn't have to bother or interrupt or, or create problems for the local IT department. So it's, 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 an interesting, um, it's just an interesting thing to note when it comes to procurement that it's not happening necessarily centrally in departments uh, anymore. It's happening sort of all over the place because of the relative cheapness of getting access to cloud-like services. Um, okay, cool. So if, uh, if there's no further questions, what I might do is ask you all to please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you very much to our remote people. Our local people. And I will bid our remote buddies goodbye. Thank you so much for, for coming online. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Pia. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Um, and leave call. Yes. Good. Um, and and uh, what we'll do is we'll kick into our, our next panel. Um,